so uh, let's bring all this into together into how we've articulated or operationalized all of this in in the tool and hopefully what has become clear throughout all our um, talking is the, the situations in which we are at low risk of bias are you know res relatively straightforward to articulate either we have no missing data or you know, a really trivial amount of missing data uh, in which case there can be no problem of missing data no bias due to missing data because there is no problem of missing data or we might have evidence from sensitivity analyses that investigate the full range of plausible assumptions about what might have happened to the people who are missing uh, and they show that the, the result is not biased by the missing outcome data to, to any important extent or we have some reason to believe or evidence that missingness in the outcome does not depend on its true value because in that situation uh, we won't have any bias what then becomes more tricky is identifying problems in which there is a high risk of bias. And uh, although that is a complicated um, situation with many um, ways to get there, we have actually taken a relatively simple approach by only asking about the likelihood that missingness in the outcome depends on its true value. Um, it, I, we recognize it's one of the most challenging questions in the tool that addresses that. Well, let me show you what the questions are that explicitly target those, those the issues on that slide. So we first ask whether uh, outcome data were available for all or essentially all of the participants randomized. Uh, if that's not the case, we ask whether there's evidence um, that the result was not biased, which would be from sensitivity analyses by and large. Um, and if that's not the case, then we ask uh, in, in, in two levels, the easier question, could missingness depend on its true value? And if it could, is it likely that missingness in the outcome depend on its true value? So there are only four questions that try and capture all of the, all of the things that we uh, dealt with. So uh, it really, um, uh, it's, yeah, I suppose, reading the guidance to know the best way to answer these questions is uh, about the best uh, guidance we can offer. Well, uh, just to say, Julian, just before you skip on to the, next, the algorithm, um, that in answering the question, could missingness in the outcome depend on its true value? And the elaboration to the question makes this clear. You should be thinking about, did the proportions of missing outcome data differ between the intervention and the control groups? Uh, is there evidence that missingness in the outcome data depended on its true value because of the reasons for missingness or because the reasons for missingness varied between the intervention groups? So that's how you, uh, you answer 3.3 and 3.4. It's based on the considerations we discussed earlier on. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, John. So we've turned these four questions into uh, an algorithm, which um, is, is straightforward. As I said, we get to low risk of bias either because we had no missing data or we had outcome data for all participants. Um, if not, then we're also low risk of bias then if there's evidence that it was not biased. And if there's no evidence, then we look at whether missingness could depend on its true value. If it could not, for whatever reason, uh, for example, the uh, examples of the fire or the random sample or other reasons that are clearly unrelated to the true outcomes that would have been measured, that would be at low risk of bias. And then we start getting to the higher risk of bias. If we think it's likely that missingness depended on the true value, then we call that high risk of bias. On the other hand, um, the last uh, situation is that we think, we, well, there are missing data. We don't have evidence that it wasn't biased. It could depend, missingness could depend on the true value, but we're not convinced that it did, then that's a situation that we would articulate some concerns. There are missing data, but no evidence that it was probably a problem, so we're just a bit worried. Right, I think at that point we must um, use our remaining minutes to try and um, clear up some of the some of the questions here. Um, um, just uh, how to how to use baseline values. Uh, I think you can use them you can potentially use them there's a there's a there's a bit of a compound question from yan ni gan um 
So I think baseline characteristics could provide evidence that missingness in the outcome relates to its true value if people with worse prognosis are more likely to have missing outcome data. Uh, and in the in, in the event of uh, in in the event of the intervention having an effect, that would also lead to the proportion of missing outcome data varying between the groups. Uh, just to Jaime Del Rio, I am not going to get into a discussion of the recovery trial, but I, I don't think that dexamethasone is a confounding factor. So there's, there's a question that. Um... A while ago, should we avoid or should we not avoid using any imputed data because imputed data is susceptible to bias from study authors? No, that's an interesting question. One thing we haven't mentioned that um, is relevant here is that imputing outcomes is something that trialists often do, but it's also something meta-analysts can often do. If you've got a, a two by two table, in fact, a three by two table uh, by intervention group uh, events, non-events and don't knows, the missing data, then we could fill in those don't knows with different values. And there are a number of methods out there um, that can be very quite useful sensitivity analysis by putting in the wide range of plausible values to see how much impact it has on the, the effect estimate. So yes, imputed data analysis can be useful. Um, we do need to be cautious when using trialists because they may have, and I think this is what's underlying the question, picked and chosen their, um, their, their imputations to, to try and demonstrate there isn't a problem in their trial, um, whereas you could try some different imputations that shows that the result is not quite as robust as it might seem. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you judge um, whether there is a difference in the proportion of missing data in the two groups? Uh, I mean, it, there would be nothing wrong with performing a statistical test to check it just wasn't chance variability in the proportions missing between the two, the two groups, Anna. Um, what if the authors did not report any information about the missing data, or they don't report the, uh, or they don't report the reasons? For example, this is Joseph Yang. Uh, it's a good question, Joseph. I think in those situations, if we would simply have to ask. Could missingness in the outcome depend on its true value? And if it could, we would end up at at least some concerns and we would just have to make a judgment. Is it likely that missingness in the outcome depended on its true value? And um, in that case, um, we would say high risk of bias. I have a question, when assessing a published trial, where is the information you need to assess the amount of missing data? Well, normally the consort flow diagram these days, any trial should report a consult flow diagram, and that should make clear both the number of participants with missing outcome data and the consult flow diagram asks trial authors to report reasons for missing outcome data as well. 